Okay. Thank you. Good morning. We're just going to let everybody kind of roll in here for a moment. Okay. Thanks, everybody. So we're just going to give everybody a minute or two to just keep logging in and uh, getting acquainted, and then we'll kick off. So one more moment. Okay, so if everybody's ready, I'll go ahead and kick off. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to <clears throat> the Orange County IDA's webinar on understanding loan forgiveness for the Paycheck Protection Program. I'm Laurie Viasuso. I'm the CEO of the Orange County IDA. And uh, we're happy today to bring you this fifth in a series of webinars that's sponsored by the Orange County IDA to help Orange County businesses cope with COVID-19. We've covered a variety of business topics on these webinars, from what to expect from the CARES Act, to human resources in a COVID environment, to re-envisioning your business now and in the future. Today, we're gonna to discuss PPP, the Payroll Protection Program, with an eye towards federal guidance on loan forgiveness. We're fortunate, once again, to have representatives from McAllister and Quinn here with us to help guide us through this sometimes confusing program that has become somewhat of a moving target. Um, before I turn it over to Chris Fish, Casey Newell, and Jake Pardoon, I'd just like to remind everyone that you can ask questions through the dialog box on your screen. We'll get to as many as we can today, and as we can't get to, we'll follow up with after the webinar. In addition, we'll have a very brief three-question poll at the end of today's webinar that we really hope you'll answer to help us determine the topics for future webinars. Finally, we'll be hosting another webinar next Thursday at 10 to continue the discussion on the PPP. And at that time, we'll have an accountant with us who'll be able to address, address some of the PPP record keeping details and even more procedure. So with that all being said, I'd like to turn it over to Chris, Casey, and Jake. Thank you, Lori. And uh, just to follow up on Lori's comments, our agenda for this is going to be to recap the SBA Paycheck Protection Program to walk you through some statistics in terms of how this PPP program is playing in New York State. Uh, also walk you through the current status of the Paycheck Protection Program. And then review navigating the loan forgiveness to date uh, questions uh, and give you a sense too in terms of looking forward, what can we, what can we expect potentially in terms of additional um, uh, small business relief in future stimulus packages. Just a disclaimer, uh, this, this is obviously general information that we're providing that uh, the Orange County Industrial Development Agency is providing. So this is not legal you know, or uh, accounting uh, advice, but again, guidance and you know, the most up-to-date information that we see that's coming out from uh, the Small Business Administration. Just a little recap on the SBA Paycheck Protection Program. The loan program's designed, as I think you all know, to incentivize small businesses to maintain their payrolls during COVID-19. These loans can range from about $10 million, uh, carry an interest rate of 1% for two-year maturity, and can defer up to six months. Uh, applying, obviously, would be uh, small businesses, again, you know, through banks. Um, eligibility for this is for-profits, nonprofits, tribal concerns, veteran organizations, more or less organizations with under obviously 500 employees. Uh, the size standards, we'll go through this a little bit in terms of guidance. And also we will go through a little bit just on SBA affiliation rules in terms of ownership. And we've covered that I believe too in uh, prior, uh, prior webinars. On loan forgiveness, Paycheck Protection Program loanees can receive up to a uh, total loan forgiveness if they qualify and use the guidance, which again, we're gonna review in this presentation. And I think Lori mentioned it uh, earlier, but just the prior webinars that we've done uh, on this topic and also this webinar will be on the um, OCIDA uh, website. So again, you can, you can look at this information after the webinar as well. Just to give you a sense from New York State, we thought to share with you there's been two rounds of uh, funding, you know, through two stimulus packages for the Paycheck Protection Program. 
And just to give you an idea, you know, in terms of the number of uh, approved loans in New York State, first round was 81,000 roughly, the second round uh, 190,000, you know, over 270,000 loans through PPP for New York State. And I think we'll just go to the average loan size. Um, you can see the first round 251,000, second round 99,000, and then overall about 144,000. We would just mention that if, if you are on this call and you're, you're still waiting in terms of your application being processed through the bank for the second round of funding that you're in, um, just to give you a sense, about 75% of the funding that we see for the second round has actually been allocated to date, there still is more money. So if again, you have an application in with the bank, you're waiting for it in terms of the processing, uh, there, there's still money obviously then that you can secure for that PPP. Uh, through this uh, second round of funding. We thought just to mention on the EIDL, just so you all know, um, first and foremost, the EIDL right now is really just focused for agriculture related businesses, uh, a little bit closed out in terms of others. And again, this program has been a little bit um, oversaturated in terms of uh, the number of folks actually uh, going after it as well. <laughs> Just on the rollout for the PPP, you know, just, just a little bit more depth for you here. You know, the first stimulus the CARES Act passed on March 27th, and I think just to give you a sense, it provided 350 billion in PPP loans. They, ban it, they began accepting applications on uh, April 3rd. Uh, April 24th, the department started to, started to issue additional guidelines and eligibility. And then the second round of funding uh, was released for April 27th. You know, they obligated that first round of funding, the $350 billion for PPP loans in 13 days. So that money um, went very, very quickly. Uh, the program ran out of funding. Congress appropriated an additional $310 billion uh, to the program. And again, currently about 75% of that funding has been obligated. Uh, it's important to note, too, again, if you're still in the process for a PPP now, the second round of funding, it does include 60 billion for a set aside for distribution by mid and small, uh, small sized uh, qualified lenders. I think one of the criticisms were larger uh, organizations, you know, uh, again, securing some of that um, uh, funding in terms of the first round and into the second round. Uh, program difficulties, I think uh, Lori uh, mentioned this as well. Just the PPP rules, you know, literally are beyond the fly, ha literally have been on the fly and uh, a moving target for small businesses and lenders. Um, this, this past month, SBA Treasury has released upwards of about nine uh, guide, guidance documents. We're going to go through the highlights of these documents, also show you where you can look at the documents directly uh, on the SBA website. Um, it's a good idea to check this regularly. I do think um, um, OCIDA is positioned to assist on this uh, with you as well. Uh, SBA has failed to release, just to share with you, the final loan forgiveness guidance. So SBA, as a reminder, was required by law to provide the final loan forgiveness guidance within the 30 days of the CARES Act enactment. So again, that goes back to April, or excuse me, to March 27th. Uh, currently, we're at about a 45-day uh, period right now, still with no final, final guidance. So this is something I know that um, obviously they're working on, but the sooner, I think, for everyone on this call, you know, we can have the finalized guidance, the better. We're going to turn it to Jake now to yeah, walk you through uh, navigating loan forgiveness. Thanks, Chris. And, and uh, to Chris's point earlier, just uh, about uh, final guidance not being shared by the, uh, both the SBA and the Treasury Department. This is, uh, these slides are what we know to date. This is what information is out there currently. So I think just the first point to make is qualified uses of the loan that you can get forgiven. So the SBA will forgive uh, the loan uh, principal amount uh, that's used to maintain a borrower's workforce, which is payroll costs, over an eight-week period they call the covered period. Funding can also cover rent, um, mortgage, mortgage interest payments, uh, debt obligation interest payments, uh, and utilities that were incurred prior to February 15th. I think an important note and a cause for some confusion um, related to qualified uses is if you're paying independent contractors, that's not going to be included. Uh, in terms of payroll costs. Independent contractors are eligible for Paycheck Protection Program themselves. So that's not a part of the calculation or, or what can be forgiven. 
I think just in terms of payroll costs that are forgivable, these aren't just you know salary and wages. These are salary, wages, benefits, including um, payment of vacation, um, parental, medical, and sick leave. Uh, even severance packages uh, can qualify for payroll costs. Um, obviously, uh, healthcare benefits um, through uh, group healthcare plans. Um, and then I think what's an important distinction as well is payroll. the payroll costs that are forgivable do cover state and local taxes. They do not cover uh, federal taxes, however. So that's an important distinction. Um, so again, excluded from payroll costs um, uh, that, that won't be forgiven um, from the total loan amount would be the compensation of employees who don't reside in the United States, uh, the compensation of individual employees in excess of $100,000 in compensation. So an employee's compensation up to $100,000, and this is total compensation, not just you know, a wage or salary, qualifies for forgiveness. Um, anything beyond that does not qualify for forgiveness. Um, in, in terms of uh, 401k and, and retirement plans, I, I didn't mention that as well, um, but that, that is included in terms of um, the total compensation and benefits. So it does um, pay for retirement um, contributions. Um, and again, federal employment taxes are not, uh, are, are not eligible for forgiveness. Also, uh, qualified um, sick and family leave, so the uh, Family Medical Leave Act wages um, related to COVID are also not covered um, for loan forgiveness. Um, there is a separate credit for employers that they can access to help pay for um, funding those wages um, for folks that do qualify for um, the special FMLA provisions that were in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And Chris mentioned this just, but in terms of forgiveness, uh, these loans can be completely forgiven up to and including um, the accrued interest. Um, to qualify, uh, the borrowers must use all of their loan proceeds. So the, the entire loan amount for um, the different usages, qualified uses that I had gone through in the previous slide, while also maintaining uh, the number of employees and in comp the compensation of, of your employees uh, at a level relative to a pre-loan period, and we'll go into how to calculate that um, in, in a couple slides from now. I think one other important thing to mention too, uh, in terms of the forgiveness uh, aspect, is only 25% of the loan um, can be uh, forgiven um, that's used on, on non-payroll costs. So 75% basically needs to be used for payroll costs. You can use 25% for non-payroll costs. Um, such as the mortgage interest payments, rent, and utilities, um, but 75% of that has, of that loan has to be uh, used towards payroll costs to qualify for full forgiveness. Uh, I, I will mention there is partial forgiveness available. It's, this is not an all or nothing um, or full forgiveness or, or no forgiveness type of a situation. Um, it's going to be a sliding scale in terms of partial forgiveness, but I think uh, what we, we really need besides what's been issued to date is some uh, final guidance from SBA and the Treasury Department on how to do this calculation. Uh, you know, we have initial guidance, but you really need the final guidance um, to, to help businesses start to plan and prepare on how much uh, they're going to be getting back. So as of now, uh, in terms of calculating the loan forgiveness, um, you will get part of your loan forgiveness decreased uh, if there's been a reduction in full-time equivalent employees. So this, this at the moment is going to be uh, a calculation that um, will take place by multiplying the total amount of potential loan forgiveness by a fraction. And that fraction is going to be uh, the numerator as the average number of full-time equivalent employees of the borrower uh, during the eight-week period the covered period of, of the Paycheck Protection Program loan. The denominator of the fraction is gonna be uh, either two numbers. So you can either choose the average number of full-time equivalent em employees that you had between February 15th of 2019 and June 30th, 2019, or the average number of full-time equivalent employees of the borrower between January 1st, 2020 and February 29th, 2020. And if you're a seasonal employer, um, you use the first bullet. Um, if you're if you're not uh, deemed a seasonal employer um, by the Small Business Administration, you can uh, choose either one of the calculations uh, for your denominator of your fraction there to to calculate your um, your end uh, loan forgiveness. So you know presumably that would be which whichever one is is lower, which would give you a higher uh, dollar amount of loan forgiveness. 
Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. I think just uh, AJ gets that, showing up as the next slide on mine. Oh, sorry, so not on yours. Yeah, it just, it just. Um, thank you. Uh, another um, way you can decrease your total loan forgiveness is upon uh, salary reduction. So at the moment, and we're looking for more clarification on this, but um, you would get your loan, potential loan forgiveness reduced if um, the employee uh, received a reduction in pay of more than twenty five percent during the covered period. So you can um, reduce pay um, a little bit in a sense, but if it goes um, more than 25%, um, you will get uh, you know loan forgiveness amount knocked down at, at the end at the moment. Uh, they might clarify this, but that, that's the current calculation. I think it, a question that a lot of people have is in terms of rehiring employees or restoring uh, wages, um, there is some leeway here. So uh, if you had reductions in employment or the salary of employees that occurred uh, between February 15th of 2020 and April 26th of 2020, um, these can be cured and will not affect the amount of uh, loan forgiveness. If you, by June 30th, uh, restore um, those reductions, you eliminate those reductions in employees or the reduction in wages. I think one interesting um, part of this that we're also looking for clarification on is at the moment, there's no requirement that the borrower rehires the same employees. You just need to restore the number of full-time equivalent employees. So, you know, right now that's sufficient in, in terms of um, meeting that standard of, of rehiring and restoring wages. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what ends up in the final uh, guidance, but at the moment, that's what uh, the SBA is going with, which gives a little bit of flexibility. Um, I think a question, uh, how is the, the loan forgiveness um, you know, going to be uh, given back to you. Um, the, the borrower needs to go through the lender that you got the loan from, um, and the lender will have an application uh, that the SBA uh, will, will work with them on. Uh, the, so they're going to have their application, and then they're going to request, the lender is going to request documents that would verify um, the number of full-time equivalent employees and your pay rates um, from before the period and what, uh, before the, the period of the loan and what you currently are at, as well as um, any payments on eligible mortgage lease or utility obligations. Um, I, I will just, you know, I'm not an accountant, but this is really important that you document dollar for dollar every single um, use of the loan program. So I would just be very vigilant on documenting every single dollar from the PPP program that you're using for whatever reason. Um, the application for forgiveness is gonna be due within 90 days of the expiration of your eight week funding period. Uh, and the approval process uh, in, in terms of them approving uh, the forgiveness and you getting your money back uh, uh, um, or not having to, to spend, the, spend the money in terms of loan payments um, is expected to be completed within 60 days of the application. So it's gonna be you know, a few months um, for all this to be processed um, post the eight week cover period. So, I'm just gonna jump in here and go over some frequently asked questions that we've been seeing um, both through the IDA and other resources. So I think probably the first one, and this is one of the most commonly asked, is some confusion on just what qualifies as certifying loan necessity. So this is gonna be, as Jake went over, kind of a key factor um, that you're gonna to wanna to determine when it comes to not returning the actual PPP funding. So. Just in short, even though the CARES Act suspends the regular requirements that borrowers must be unable to obtain credit through other resources, you're still gonna to have to certify in good faith that your PPP loan request was necessary. And some of the factors that you're gonna to wanna to take into account there are just gonna be your current business activity, your ability to access other sources of liquidity, and especially in a manner that is not detrimental to your business. Also, businesses that with their affiliates accepted PPP funds less than $2 million, there's going to be an assumption that you're going to perform the required certification um, in good faith to uh, regarding the necessity of your loan. For borrowers with loans that exceed $2 million, 
you still might want to have an adequate basis for making the required good faith certification just based on your individual circumstances and the language of the certification and the SBA guidance. Now, another question that we get frequently is, will the SBA review individual PPP loan files? And kind of a twofold answer, I'm gonna let Jake jump in on the second half on this one. But in short, yes, the SBA has decided after consulting the Department of the Treasury that it's going to review all loans in excess of $2 million with some other qualifying loans following the actual lender submission of the loan forgiveness applications. Yeah, I'll just jump in by saying, um, I think there was a lot of uh, confusion uh, when the SBA issued uh, in one of their uh, interim final guidance documents uh, that you have to certify, um, you know, the economic necessity of the PPP loan. So even though um, you don't need to exhaust uh, other available um, lines of the credit, um, the CARES Act suspended that, Casey walked through that. Um, there was kind of a ambiguity on, on what um, that certification or, um, you know, making the case for the, the necessity of the loan was. And the SBA yesterday clarified that. So there's a $2 million threshold. If you're under 2 million, you're not gonna get, um, you know, audited uh, for the most, you know, I mean, they still have the right to audit, audit you for, for reasons, but for the most part, um, the two, if you're under 2 million, you're not gonna get audited. If you're over 2 million, they will look at your, your PPP loan um, documents that they will review them and um, there, there will be an audit performed on them. So that's really the threshold. If you're under 2 million, I wouldn't worry about any of the certifying loan necessity uh, aspects um, that you've probably been hearing in the news or, um, you know, through, through other folks. If you're over 2 million, um, there, there will be an audit. Regardless though, I would, again, be vigilant and dollar for dollar um, mm -hmm. verifying how you use the, the PPP loan funds to the best of your ability. Yeah, I would just jump into just a comment just to make on calculating loan forgiveness. Just, you know, for folks that have loans under $2 million, you know, the economic necessity in terms of having, you know, these loans, think in terms of what it would cost in terms of if you use the line of credit, in terms of the interest payments, can you afford the interest payments? If your company has no income and you're going to take an existing line of credit or a new line of credit from a bank, and you have no income, you're gonna to have to pay the interest. You know, with the PPP, with the forgiveness, um, you won't have to, you know, repay that interest, you know, once it's forgiven. That's one way I think for the smaller companies to look at this, you know, in terms of good faith, in terms of meeting the criteria. And just to um, follow up on the slide now, for, for SBA Treasury Department uh, guidance, we just wanted to list out here for you, these are all the links to all the guidance documents that have been put out to date um, from the Small Business Administration. Th these are here, I think, for all of you to, you know, take a look at. I do think, too, uh, the folks at um, IDA, um, you know, can also assist in terms of some of the review uh, in these sections. But this is everything that we have to date. There will be more, you know, uh, again, final, you know, guidance uh, coming out. But if you haven't looked at these in uh, detail, probably probably a good idea, again, to take a look. And again, I think uh, IDA here uh, can coordinate with you in terms of assistance. I think just um, a few things looking forward on, on the, um, the Paycheck Protection Program some potential changes that may materialize through additional legislation and, and guidance from the SBA and, and Treasury Department. Um, what, one uh, item that might materialize would be an extension of the program's covered period past June 30th of 2020. Uh, there also um, could be an extension of the forgivable use window past the eight week period. Again, this isn't currently um, uh, in, in the Paycheck Protection Program guidance, but this is something that may come online. Um, expansion of forgivable non-payroll costs up to 50% from 25%. Um, this is in response to a lot of uh, issues small businesses are having. You know, the money is better spent in, in terms of um, keep keeping the business sustainable. Um, to use funding for, you know, high rent costs, you know, if you're in a city um, or, or other allowable usages, um, not so much payroll. So I think that's one that um, 
you know, might come to fruition. There's a lot of bipartisan support for that, for moving that from 25 to 50%, allowing a little bit more flexibility for the small business owners um, to use the funding. And then I think another one um, that we might be seeing is a deduction of expenses paid with a forgiven PPP loan um, from uh, employer's federal taxes. So those are the four um, potential changes um, that we see that uh, may materialize. I think uh, the SBA um, does owe everyone, you know, new and final guidance on how loan forgiveness is going to work. Um, you know, we walked through how it's laid out to date. Um, they are going to be publishing final guidance uh, any day now. So I would just make sure that, um, you know, you're checking up on that. And I know uh, McAllister and Quinn us and, and OCIDA will, will help you all in, in terms of disseminating information, you know, via their website as well. So I think that's just, you know, a couple of things to track, changes to the program, and then final guidance on the, on the loan forgiveness from SBA. And then I'll turn it to Chris, just in terms of, if you have more detailed or pressing questions and concerns, how to maybe work with OCA IDA um, on getting those answered. Yeah, I, I would just say that, uh, again, with, with questions, there'll, there'll be questions that uh, the IDA, you know, Tom, uh, Sarah, uh, Nancy, you know, um, you know, we'll be able to help answer for you. And then we'll be working with them as well on questions. And then there's gonna be questions potentially that we can't answer. So there's gonna be also two questions that you might wanna take uh, to your bank uh, that provided the loan. And if there's a, a comfort level issue with that, you know, understood. Uh, the questions that we don't have guidance on, you know, that we just don't have guidance on, I think what we're going to try to do is, you know, IDA is going to gather questions and then we're going to have a conversation with uh, Representative Maloney's office and see about Representative Maloney's office taking questions, you know, directly to the SBA uh, again for answer. So I think we'll, we'll try to help throughout this process. And in terms of some of the questions that we don't have the guidance on and we're, you know, pushing for, you know, answers in terms of guidance. I think, again, the, uh, the IDA is very much positioned to, um, to work with Representative Maloney and uh, from an organized fashion, you know, take these questions in bulk uh, to the SBA. So we've received a lot of questions during this meeting, um, some that we've also received prior to it. And we just want to give everyone an opportunity to have an interactive Q&A session. So um, I see that a lot of folks have actually already started doing it. But if you could use the question and answer function um, in your Zoom dialog box, um, we'll just be going through um, as many of those as we can here. So the first question that I see is from Gary Shuster. Oh, allowed uses rent and utilities incurred prior to February 15th, not during the current covered period? Yeah, so what that means just in terms of the February 15th is if you got into a rent agreement prior to February 15th, that's an allowable, um, you know, rent expense that you can use the funding for. So if you got into a rental agreement, you know, a week ago and you have the paycheck protection program funding, you're not going to be allowed to use it to pay for rent um, on any um, agreement that um, was started or initiated um, after February 15th. And that's the same for, um, utilities and uh, mortgage payments. So it's, you know, things that were existing prior to um, all of the, you know, issues related to COVID. It's not for um, new items that, you know, new leases or debt obligations that uh, you've incurred after that February 15th date. So another question from Rita Epstein, and it's, do the finance charges from company credit cards fall under the debt obligation interest category? Um, I, I, I will say, I think it does, but I would clarify this with your bank, um, your lender, who you got the loan from or who you're potentially getting the loan from. Um, but I, I do think, um, you know, this part of small business debt would be um, considered a debt obligation, but I would just double check um, with your lender. So another question from Rita. Now, <clears throat> as Jake covered, you can reformulate, you can uh, hire employees that weren't originally on the payroll to maintain um, your payroll compensation levels. But Rita's asking, what if the number of employees itself is reduced, but the payroll stays the same via adjusted wages? 
so the i'm just trying to so there's less employees but you're still paying like a fewer amount of employees the same payroll um i mean part of the calculation is the number of employees so that would still affect your your loan forgiveness because it it, it's part of the calculation in terms of reduction of the number of full-time equivalent employees so i think that's another thing to maybe spend a minute clarifying so there's two different employee counts for this program and i know it's confusing but for eligibility in terms of the 500 or less employees that chris was walking us through at the beginning of the powerpoint that whole calculation includes your full-time employees part-time employees as well but in terms of loan forgiveness all that matters is full-time equivalent employees so if you reduce any full-time equivalent employees compared to the period, and we walk through the two different periods you can use as a calculation. If you're reducing any employees, but even if your payroll is staying the same, I think um, there'll, there'll be an issue with, with loan forgiveness there. Um, and again, it's, it's not full or nothing, it's partial. So um, we'll, we'll need to see how the sliding scale of partial forgiveness works um, when SBA releases their final guidance. But I, I do think that would affect the forgiveness. So another question from Suzanne Schindler, what qualifies as utilities other than the obvious items like gas and electric, for example, internet and telephone expenses? Um, that, that's a good question. And uh, I, I would, you know, my best guess would be that those do qualify under utilities, but I think that's, an, again, something to clarify um, with the SBA, that's a good question. Um, just what all is included in the term utilities? I'm sure that that would probably be fine, uh, but yeah, I think it'd be um, good to double check because um, that is a a broad term, utilities, and, and what's included in that. Um, I, I'm sure the phone bill and, and that stuff and the internet is is included, but um, maybe it, just in general, what, what else besides that might be included is is a good question. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put this on the list, folks, in terms of questions to, to, uh, to clarify with, with Rep Maloney and SBA. So the definition of what exactly are utilities, this, this will be on that list. Good question. <clears throat> so another question um, from Kim Markle asking, how does this entire process apply to sole proprietorships? Does it follow roughly the same track as independent contractors or are there some differences? Um, I think it follows the same track um, as, it, as the small business or, or uh, independent contractor. So you're, you're gonna still have to um, fill out the, um, all the required paperwork and go through the lender. All the forgiveness functions will be the same. Um, obviously it's, it's probably going to be, um, you know, under the 2 million threshold. So you won't have to uh, make any certification of economic necessity. Um, I think you can expect it to follow, um, the same process as, as you would if you were, um, a 10 person company or, or a one or two company. Um, it, it, it'll be roughly similar. Let's see. Question from Maria Reeves, would vacation payouts for active employees qualify under payroll costs that are forgivable, specifically employees that continue to work but might otherwise lose vacation balances if they don't work? I think this one is sort of in the same category as utilities. I, I wanna say that um, you, you can use it to pay out the benefits of the employees, but if this is something that we should double check. Um, you know, I, I would, my best guess would be that you could use it for that, but um, that, that's definitely something to clarify in terms of um, whether they're actually using the benefit or they're um, you know, just getting a payout of, of the existing benefit if there's a difference there in terms of what they'll accept uh, for forgivable uh, uses of the loan. So I think that one um, should go on the list uh, that, that we're gonna you know, help get you an answer for um, in terms of clarification. Question from Sandy Nagler. Can businesses apply for a second paycheck protection program loan if they're closed longer than eight weeks? Uh, no, the, currently there's only, you're only eligible to get one paycheck protection program loan. Um, they, they might, uh, depending on the circumstances uh, with all the public health crisis and economic crisis, uh, have a, you know, a second 
round of funding for existing PPP um, you know, loan ease, but at, at this point, it's it's just one, uh, not two. You can only get one. You can get other SBA loans. Um, the EIDL program Chris mentioned is currently closed to non-agricultural businesses at the moment. Uh, it's just been oversubscribed. Um, but but you are eligible to get other SBA loans outside of Paycheck Protection Program, but you can only access one PPP loan. Yeah, to, to Jake's point, I would just add that just watch the news and, and definitely be in touch with the IDA. We're just going to have to see what the next stimulus package is. So on the next stimulus package, will there be, for example, anything in there on continuation for existing PPPs in terms of securing additional funding? Or do you have to, you know, potentially, if you can, in the next stimulus package, if they allow you to go after another, you know, PPP, are you going to have to go through the whole application process again? Uh, all, all this is to be determined, and we're just going to have to, you know, see how Congress um, and the administration uh, put this together. So definitely something we're, we're watching, but I think too, just uh, in the news, this, this would be something that we'd see in the news as it starts to come up. Another question from Jamie Codino. If a small business organized as a sole proprietorship doesn't have group health coverage, but only a policy for the owner, is that forgivable? Um, I, I would, again, I think this falls into the other two. I mean, my best guess is that it would, um, but that's something that uh, for sole, sole proprietors that we need to get clarified. I think a lot of the issues with, with the sole proprietorships um, is for the most part, they're not eligible um, for the existing SBA programs. So pre, you know, COVID-19 crisis, um, SBA had these loan programs. They obviously changed them, um, become the Paycheck Protection Program. They modified them. Um, but before, those, those companies weren't eligible, so there's not a lot of guidance on sole proprietorships for SBA loans. So I think my best guess is that it, it would be an ineligible, forgivable expense, um, but we, that's, that's something that we should clarify just in terms of the definition. And uh, they don't provide very detailed definitions of all the, the benefits and, and um, like, you know, defining utilities and that sort of thing. So I think that's something that we can definitely help out with is getting um, more of a clear picture on um, what is all included in those definitions. But my best guess is that, yes, it would be uh, at this point. So a question from Alan Joseph. For leases that require business insurance policies, can these necessary insurances be considered a covered non-payroll expense? Um, yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think I think they I think they go on, Jake. Yeah, I was I was just gonna say I think if it's tied to your lease, it would probably be um, that that would that would make sense as an eligible expense. But um, if it's outside of that. Uh, I mean, if they're requiring it, I don't know. I think that's one I'd, we'd need a little bit more details on, uh, unless, Chris, you have some uh, another. Um, no, I, I was just going to add, I, I think it should be covered, but we'll, we'll look at this as well. But for that 25% outside of the um, payroll, uh, this, should, this should fall into it. To Jake's point, we just don't have a list of every single item that can be covered in the 25% section outside of payroll. So this insurance question, we'll add it to it. It should be covered, but I think it's wise folks, you know, if, if we're not sure and it's not listed, let's add it to the list and see what we can get answered uh, directly by SBA, by Rep. Malone. So a question from uh, actually anonymous, do you need to have your 2019 taxes completed to apply? I don't know if we know the answer to that. Um, I, I would say that if, um, if you have an extension on your uh, 2019 taxes, uh, there might be something there to work with. Um, if you're in violation, um, I do think that might be a concern, but um, we, we can ask, ask the question on uh, 2019 uh, tax extensions. If you haven't paid your taxes, you haven't um, you know, secured an extension, uh, it's, I think it's going to be problematic, but um, we, we can ask in terms of tax extension for sure. 
Another anonymous question. Would bonus payments paid out during the covered period count towards payroll costs? Yeah, yes, it's, it's for all compensation. So uh, whether it's a commission or bonus, that, that's part of the compensation. But um, just keep in mind though, anything over $100,000 for each employee won't be covered as a forgivable cost. So, Maybe, you know, you, maybe Jake, on, on that point, though, it's just, it's up to 100000 So up yeah, to 100000 yeah, if I'm correct. Yeah, so up to $100,000 per employee is covered. So if someone's securing compensation over 100000 that won't be covered and you can't use it in your formula allocation. So a question from Rick Kawada. Do state unemployment taxes paid before the eight week period count as payroll costs. Can you repeat that, sorry? Do state unemployment insurance taxes paid in full prior to the eight week period count for payroll costs? Uh, no, so uh, the only thing that you can get forgiven is what's spent in the eight week period. Um, so that wouldn't count. So a question from Nia Mosey. If you don't use the full amount of your PPP loan, will you be required to pay it back after the eight week period? Yeah, so I mean, the, the eight week period is, that's the time when you can use all the funding and then you document what you use the funding for and then you get it forgiven. Anything else that you're not using is gonna carry forward as a loan. So you can, you know, th at that point you would pay, um, the, the loan uh, principal amount back that you didn't use. So um, yeah, I, you, you would have to pay it back. Yeah, that, that, that's the answer. Question from Madeline Sorrentino. Does malpractice insurance for doctors fall into any of the forgivable categories? Yeah, we did, we'd have to check on that one too, just in terms of um, all the different um, allowable, you know, un underneath the the, uh, the non-payroll costs, what what would be um, considered uh, an eligible uh, use of the funding? Um, not not sure about malpractice um, insurance, sir. Yeah, I, I I think I think the definition here is going to be insurance, and again, out in that twenty five percent category. You know, the, the thought, regardless if it's malpractice insurance or if it's insurance for a lease, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get an answer for this on insurance. Uh, I don't see why it wouldn't be covered, but we'll, we'll get an answer for it. Good question, but we'll get an answer for that. We'll, we'll ask for an answer for this. So another anonymous question, just to reconfirm, this program helps employers who may not be open, but wish to retain and continue to pay their employees to incentivize them to stay on your payroll. Uh, yeah, that, that's correct. Absolutely. You, don't to, you don't have to be open or as open as you were before. Um, it, it's all about just paying uh, the employees that you had before this whole crisis began. A, another anonymous question. For employers, I mean employees earning over 100,000 per year, does the unforgivable portion only take place after that employee has earned 100,000 or is it prorated through? Um, from unforgivable portion. I think, um, I think if you're asking yeah, if, yeah, if you make a if you make a hundred thousand a year, if you're asking if it's just prorated for that eight week period, um, l let us double check. But I'm pretty sure they're going to base this on you know the uh, the average the annual sal the average the annual salary. So if if that was the case, anybody making over a hundred thousand a year, you know, would or over a hundred thousand a year, excuse me, you know, over that eight week period, um, you know, could could uh, could fall into that uh, formula for under a hundred thousand. I don't think it's prorated, but let us see if we can get you an answer on that. And that's one, two, I think maybe talk to your bank, but let us see if we can get you an answer on that. So a question from Susan Muzzer. Do increases to regular employee pay, i.e. hazard pay, count under payroll costs? Yeah. 
I'm not sure maybe uh, the definition in terms of in terms of hazard pay it would be an increase um, in pay and if this is something that your your company you know in good faith you know has been doing you know post before COVID-19 and then you're still doing it within COVID-19 looks to be something that you can utilize um, but we can get a definition on hazard on hazard pay if in fact it is or it is not but um, if you're creating hazard pay to utilize funding might be an issue again if it's something that you've had ongoing uh, with your company uh, that probably again in good faith you know um, uh, looks to be justified so let us let us take a look at hazard pay so another question just broadly what does the sba consider a full-time employee yeah so this is actually a very good question um, and one of the um, concerns that a lot of folks have with the guidance that's been issued so far. So um, what I've heard is that what is considered a full-time equivalent of employee will be a similar definition uh, related to um, the Affordable Health Care Act, which I think was 30 hours. Um, but th that's something that's not been determined by the SBA or if it has, it hasn't been um, articulated in a clear way in their guidance on what is a full-time equivalent employee. I would guess that it, it would follow some of the other similar federal uh, definitions for that, like over 30 hours. Um, but that's something that uh, they need to issue in the full, in the, in the final guidance uh, clarify, um, because it's, it's pretty ambiguous on, on what that means at this point. So the next question that I'm seeing is, is the small business administration going to provide any programmatic incentivization for employees who make more on unemployment to return to the businesses that they used to work at who are trying to execute on a PPP loan? Yeah, so uh, Casey, if you go back to slide 11 uh, sure. on the PowerPoint, I just wanna um, point that out for some, some folks. All right. So on the bottom question, and the, so there isn't really uh, an incentive um, th to answer your question, but the SBA um, is going to be issuing a final rule that excludes lay off, laid off employees from the borrower offered to rehire at the same compensation and hours, um, but they declined or rejected your offer of reemployment. Um, a couple things. A, that's not going to count against you in terms of your uh, loan forgiveness calculation, and B, um, that also affects that employee's eligibility for unemployment compensation as well. So that breaks the entire spirit of the whole program. Uh, and understood, you can potentially get more money being on unemployment um, than you can uh, at your previous job. But um, if you are offered to um, get rehired and you turn it down, A, it's not going to affect the business's um, forgiveness of their loan. And B, it, it probably is going to jeopardize their um, unemployment benefits um, because they rejected an offer for reemployment. So just wanted to point that out um, on that slide. All right, give me a second to pull this back. Let's see. So Claudio Zumba asks, I haven't paid my business's rent during April, May. Will this fall into any of the forgivable categories? Um, I mean, yeah, it, 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 it should, as long as you're, you're meeting the 75%, you know, requirement for your PPP it, to be used for payroll. If you're, if you're meeting your 75% requirement on payroll and then that 25%, yeah, you should be able to use that for rent, you know, out of that 25%. But if you're not meeting that, it's um, it's going to be something that might be problematic. Yeah. So another sole proprietorship question: Can sole proprietorships with single employees under them um, have both the owners and that employee's salaries considered for forgiveness? Uh, yes, both for yeah. the, the total loan amount and for the forgiveness portion as well. Um, when, when you're accessing the funding and then when you're getting it forgiven. Let's see. 
I think I think though too the word there was employees. So if they're independent contractors under you, um, right. no. But if they're employ if they're employees under you, yes. All right. Let's see, just finding some other questions that we might have missed during this. I think maybe just one other thing to mention: um, the eight week covered period um, that we're talking about that starts as soon as you get the loan disbursement into your bank account. So it's not like when you first put the application in, it's, it's when you first get the money is, is when that eight week period starts. I know that can be confusing, but um, that, that is, uh, is it, it's not the origination of the loan, it's the disbursement of the loan. So a question from Barbara Glusoff, is there a loan forgiveness form or template available to help plan on how to allocate properly? Um, yes, and the, the, they're available on the SBA's website, which we can um, provide you. They have uh, standard forms, but the lenders also have their own forms and, and documents that they require as well. So, um, but th there is a template that you can get an idea of, of the questions being asked of you. Um, in terms of the forgiveness application, there is not uh, a forgiveness application available, but there is an application to see how to apply for a loan. So a question from Rita Epstein, do utility bills from the eight week period that aren't generated until the month afterwards um, considered forgivable? They should, they should be as long as it's during that eight week, as long as it's during that eight week period, the, uh, the date of services is what should be covered. All right, let's see here. And I'm not seeing any new questions at the moment. Oh, one just popped up. Is it acceptable to start using the loan immediately and increase usage as needed as long as you use the entirety of it by June 30th? Maybe I, I would just say I'm, I'm a, a little um, maybe confused with the question, but my, I guess my response would be yes, they're gonna want you to use the loan in terms of using it immediately, they're gonna want you to use it to pay employees. Again, 75% and then 25% you know, outside of employees. So you have that eight week window. It starts as Jake mentioned, you know, once the funding for the PPT you know, arrives in your account. So you know, yes, I'm sure maybe you know, how you pay uh, uh, your employees, if it's a weekly paycheck, a monthly paycheck, if it's a, a percentage in terms of sales, but yes, they're gonna they're gonna want you to use it to Jake's point earlier. However, right, you use so, this, make sure you have records. So another question from uh, Deborah Williams: Can she hire more full time employees during the covered period than she had prior to that period to clean and disinfect her um, oper her place of operation? I mean, would it be, I think we need a little bit more information because are those employees going to be full-time equivalent employees? Or are they um, right. going to be kind of contractors? Are they part-time? Yeah. But if you're going to hire them too, are you hiring them just for a two-week period, a two-month period, or are these going to be full-time employees that you want to keep? I think that's something that's going to be, you know, um, reviewed. If it's a service, you know, to Jake's point, if it's independent contractors, you know, or it's a service, then, you know, that 25% area, you know, in terms of, again, non-payroll, you, you, you could look at using it there. If your plan is to hire full-time employees for cleaning operations and they're staying within the company, um, I think you have to justify that, that these are not temporary employees. You know, these aren't independent contractors. They would be full-time and they're going to be hired, you know, to work uh, full-time, you know, you know, for the foreseeable future within the company. <laughs> So another question, I'm just asking for guidance on how one might fit a monthly or semi-monthly payroll schedule into an eight week period or adjust it for an eight week period. A, a semi-monthly or monthly? Yes. Um, I mean, eight weeks is, eight weeks is yeah. two months. Eight weeks is two months. 
however you're, you know, how have you been paying your employees prior? You know, how does that then fit into a, to a, to a two month period? And I think whatever you've been keeping in terms of records, if you pay them, you know, um, every two weeks, if you pay them, you know, every, uh, every uh, other week, I think you have to fit it, you know, within, within that time period for eight weeks. So I, I think this is something too with your bank. I think, um, you know, IDA mentioned to a webinar with an accounting firm, you know, coming up in the future might be a little bit more appropriate to, to, to ask that question of those folks in terms of, in terms of best business practices. But again, I think it's that, that eight week period, whatever format you pay them, you know, in that eight week period. And again, does it uh, coalesce with the uh, payment process that you had prior to COVID-19? So question here from Elizabeth Newhart. Um, if you meet the 75% payroll requirement, can you use the 25% non-payroll to pay back rent due in, for example, February or March? She received the loan May 1st. You, sh you, should, you should be able to use that, Jake. I don't recall the dates uh, off the top of my head for the uh, time period, but I, uh, if you meet the 75% threshold, yes, you should be able to use this uh, for rent payment, prior rent payment. Um, yes, you should be able to use it. If, if it meets the time period for these rent payments during COVID-19, if it's rent payments that go back prior to COVID-19, yeah. that's going to be problematic. That's something you won't be able to use it for. All right. Can workman's comp or disability be used as part of um, PPP? In terms of in terms of payment for what your company is paying into uh, workers' comp or uh, a disability insurance uh, program, can you use PPP? Um, we'll have to double check, Jake, unless you have an answer. But yeah, I don't know if that falls in. This. Yeah, and all the benefits stuff, um, items. I think we we need a clarification. Um, it, the definitions are broad, and um, I think just. All of this is fluid as well. So um, additional guidelines might be issued by SBA in the future that might modify um, certain aspects of what can be used uh, in terms of uh, allowable loan usages for forgiveness. So I, at this moment, we don't have clarification on the workers comp, uh, but that's a great question. I think that's one we can uh, help get it. All right. So a question from uh, Nia Mosey again. If full-time employees reduce their hours to part-time, does this affect loan forgiveness? Yeah, so loan forgiveness is all about um, the full-time equivalent of employees. So um, if, if you're reducing the amount of full-time equivalent employees, even if it's the same employee, but they're working part-time or if you reduce their compensation by more than 25%. At this point in time, the program will reduce your um, uh, available forgiveness. So that, I, I would just think of it as uh, the full-time equivalent employee. And, and like I said, they need to you know, come out with a, a final definition of what that is, um, whether that's over 30 hours a week. Um, but yeah, if you go from full-time to part-time, that's considered a reduction in a full-time employee. I'm just seeing a comment here, actually, from Miriam Bouchard, um, a certified business advisor at the Mid-Hudson SBDC. And um, we had already covered this, but I think it bears repeating just that some of these guidelines are going to change once the HEROES Act is signed into law. Um, and I know Chris and Jake had touched on that, but as we answer these questions, it's a good uh, asterisk to put after everything. So the next question I'm seeing is from Sandy Nagler. If she did not lay off any employees, but one of her employees who's re remained on the payroll refuses to return to work after reopening, will that impact her forgiveness? Can you, can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, so she asked if she, did, if she has not laid off any employees 
but one or several of them who remain on the payroll refuse to return to work after her business reopens. Will that impact her forgiveness? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I assume just by I, this, this is just an assumption, um, but the fact that um, you can offer to rehire someone um, and they decline you uh, and that doesn't um, count against your forgiveness. I would guess that um, folks that refuse to come to work would also be exempt from affecting your forgiveness, but I don't, I haven't seen a clarification on that. That's a really good question. Yeah, and that, that is a good question, but if they're on your payroll now, you know, you're using them for your allocation for PPP, and then your company reopens, and from a health standpoint, they don't want to come back. Um, to, to Jake's point, the assumption would be it shouldn't impact you if their decision is that they do not come back. But we'll add this to the list too in terms of a review. But uh, good, good question. But we will add this to the list of questions for review. All right, another question from Jamie Codino. So her salon is going to be closed down for possibly the entire eight week term. Her employees work on commission. Can she use the 25% for other incidentals that let me rephrase that actually. Can she use that 25% to cover the um, commission that her employees are not going to receive on top of their standard base pay? Um, I don't I think, think we it, have an answer. Yeah. yeah, it's going to depend. I mean, it, has, it has to match up to what your payroll was. So if, you, if your payroll was, um, it, it's average payroll. So if you were, if the commission, if they were always getting commission and that's part of the average that you um, use to calculate what your total loan amount that you could accept was, then that calculation would also be uh, needed for the loan forgiveness because you're, you're trying to match a period in the past where you were paying commission with what you're paying folks for that eight week period. So um, I would say that, you know, that you'd, you'd have to pay them the average, including their commission um, during that period. But that, that's a, that's a good question. Um, another one that we should get clarification on. So another question from Claudia Zumba. She owns a business where her and her employees haven't received any payment since March 15th. Can she write checks with PPP funding to make up for this lost back pay? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. What, what, what is the covered time period? What is the covered time period again, Jake? For it's whenever um, you receive, PPP? Yeah, it's whenever you receive the loan um, is when your the eight week period starts. Yeah, Claudia, maybe if you can um, clarify this in the question box, I'll keep a special eye out for that while we answer a couple more questions in the meantime. So Barbara Glustoff asks, can expenses for professional development, i.e. social media training, um, professional development classes, et cetera, be considered under the payroll portion of the loan? Uh, as of right now, no. Um, that's, okay. that's not been uh, one of the eligible uh, loan usages. All right. Let's see. Just going through some of these questions. Do employee reimbursements for cell phone usage, travel, health reimbursement expenses, et cetera, qualify as payroll expenses? Good. That's a good question. I think that's one that we would have to have to check. But also, too, did you include that when you did your calculation and you secured your PPP, did you include that in terms of the salary uh, component? If you did, you might have uh, an argument to make on this. If you did not, I don't think you do. It would be the 25 percent. But for employee uh, expenses, that's a good question in terms of payroll or outside of payroll. We, we can look into that. 
But again, it goes back to what you included in your calculation in terms of salary. <laughs> On your on your PPP application. Right, so Don Farrick asks: Do all the loan funds have to be distributed, i.e., checks issued by the last day of the eight-week period? Um, yeah. So in terms of for the loan forgiveness part, yeah, it has to be used up in the eight-week period. Um, I think that's on the one of the later slides. I talked about them, the Congress, uh, by them I mean Congress, potentially extending that period where it wasn't just for the eight week period, it'd be a longer time period. Um, you could use the loan funding over, but at, at this point it's the eight week period. So everything you wanna get forgiven would be spent in that eight week period. All right, Debbie Lester asks, she received her PPP loan on May 5th. Does this money need to be spent within the eight week period or once you receive it or by June 30th? She has seen conflicting information and would like clarification. Yeah, and that, it's very, that's a great question. It's very ambiguous. I think my interpretation of it is that it's the eight week period um, from when you, when you first get the funding um, the program does, as it's laid out here, the, the Paycheck Protection Program does come to an end June 30th. So that is um, a source of confusion and um, something that uh, the guidance that's been issued so far hasn't done a good job clarifying. I would say that it, it would be the eight week covered period. I think that's the, the key definition uh, in all of this, but um, that's something uh, probably at the top of the list of things to get clarified because uh, there is a lot of ambigu ambiguity on um, you know, if the program comes to a screeching halt June 30th, or if you're allowed to take the eight week period past June 30th. So that's a great question. I, I think um, we'll, we'll need to get some clarification on it. All right, so an, an anonymous question for regarding sole proprietorships. If a sole proprietor is receiving New York State unemployment income to cover up what they've lost in income, Will that factor into their eligibility for the PPP loan? Um, so they're receiving unemployment insurance, but they're still work, working for you. Um, I, I would just, I don't, I would have to know more about the, the individual circumstances. Um, I think so too, if, if the question was asked if the uh, sole proprietorship, the uh, individual who uh, has the sole proprietorship is collecting unemployment, you know, can they also collect, um, you know, a PPP while they're, you know, securing state unemployment? I think you want to think long and hard about that. If it's your employees, we'd have to look at it. But um, I think if, if you're collecting unemployment, you know, from the state and you want to secure a PPP at the same time, um, I, I, I'd, um, I'd tread lightly with that one. <laughs> All right, a question from uh, Joseph Grade. Um, is vacation advance pay covered under payroll costs? I think this was a question, Jake, that we had a little, we had yeah, a little this, earlier this as well. Yeah, this was a question they, from earlier. Yeah, um, and vacation. Yeah, this, this is, this is, go on, I'm sorry. No, no, that's, no, I was just going to say in terms of vacation, you know, we're going to check in terms of, I think the question earlier too was a payout. So if your employees, you know, can be paid out for vacation time versus taking a vacation, uh, can that be used? We'll, we'll check. If, if your employees are going to, uh, you know, take a vacation, I think, Jake, this would be covered in that eight-week uh, period. Um, it wouldn't be to uh, pay for, you know, vacation that you're going to schedule, you know, six months from now it would be during this uh, eight week period. I'm unsure maybe where, where they might go on vacation. But if you're looking to do a payout for vacation time, uh, you know, during this eight week period, uh, that, that's on our list in terms of questions to ask. So we're approaching the uh, end of the allotted time here and the questions have started to slim down. So maybe I'll turn it back over to Chris and Lori for closing thoughts. Maybe, Lori, I'll just say that um, I, I have about 16 questions um, that we've taken down, you know, off of the webinar. 
I know there were additional questions that have been emailed in, um, you know, to uh, to the IDA. So we'll work with the IDA, Lori. We'll work with everyone in terms of getting these questions organized. And uh, what we can't maybe answer on researching on our own, we can take to uh, Congressman Maloney and then have uh, the Congressman take them to the SBA. And again, um, we, we might not have answers, you know, to these questions, even through that process until the final guidance, you know, uh, comes out. But um, I wish we could answer, you know, all these questions for you now. We wish you could actually see it clearly, maybe from your bank or from the SBA website. Uh, unfortunately, that's just not the case. But these questions we have, Lori, we'll get it all organized, uh, work with your staff, and uh, have something that we can hopefully put uh, with the congressman in front of SBA soon. That would be great. I think I know that there are a lot of questions that um, you know are, are hyper specific, and you know obviously it's it's clear during this conversation what a moving target all of this is. You know we know that all of this is going to change, and that every business is unique. I know that we have a lot of questions that are, you know, really need specific answers. So to the extent possible, we're going to be like. Like Casey and Chris and Jacob all mentioned, we're going to catalog all of these and put them together and have something that's accessible to everyone. And for some that are very specific, we may even be able to reach out to you directly. But um, again, I want to reiterate that we're going to do this again and again and again until we can get to essentially the bottom of this. So I know it's, a, again, a moving target, sort of the classic build the plane as you're flying and trying to land it sort of scenario. So. I think that um, you know what we're going to try to do is bring as much uh, as many answers as possible and as many resources together as possible. So I encourage everyone to continue to tune in. You know, I mentioned before that we're going to have a webinar next week, which is the 21st again at 10 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have an accountant with us at that time to talk about documenting all of these things. Um, and then I think that. This interaction has really taught us that there are so many questions that we might just have a full Q&A one and bring a lot of resources to the table to kind of be able to address some questions that have submitted, been submitted in advance to get you know, some really good research done in the background. So I wanna thank everybody for participating, not only the speakers, but also all of you who've tuned in and who have been submitting your questions. I know how frustrating this must be for everybody. So we're gonna do everything we can to get as much information out as possible. Um, as a reminder, just kind of on that note too, you know, there's going to be, like we said, a survey that's going to appear on your screen in just a moment. So um, if you can answer those, that'll help us tailor our next coming webinars to make sure that we're getting the kinds of resources and the kind of representatives that those of you who are tuning in need. Um, so we encourage you to join us next week, again, May 21st at 10 o'clock for another session. We'll be sending out registration information by email, or you can check our website. Again, the website is ocnyida.com. Uh, we will have this presentation there. We will also have um, a recording of this presentation, a PDF with active links of this presentation. And then as uh, McAllister and Quinn have noted, we're gonna be sort of um, organizing, categorizing, and posting some questions and answers to our site as well so that we can have that available to everyone. So thank you to everyone who's presented and thank you to all of you who've attended and we'll see you next week.